a particular purpose, a cause, excuse me, a cause of really great excitement for our country, a bipartisan legislation that has passed the Congress uh, in the House and will be, as Leader Schumer has advised me, be taken up in the Senate next week. And that is our legislation uh, for our Postal Service. Uh, it's a privilege to be in Bayview again. Uh, we were here for our Don't Mess with the Post Office event uh, just recently down the street, and it was a pleasure to be with you then, Mr. President, President of the Board of Supervisors, as you all know, Shaman Walton. Thank you for your leadership, and thank you for your hospitality once again today. Uh, again, we're joined by some of our labor leaders who helped pass this legislation. Shirley Ten uh, Taylor, you'll be hearing from the National Business Agent of American Postal Workers Union, who are so um, is an intellectual resource to us, but also an advocacy group to pass this legislation. Christina August, Assistant Secretary Treasurer of the Golden Gate Branch of that, and then John Beaumont a regular at our meetings, a legislative and political organizer, National Association of Letter Carriers. I want to acknowledge my dear friend, Matthew Murray, who is here. Thank you, Matthew, one working for the Postal Service. And also acknowledge Avinash Kumar, who was the acting Postal Master General of San Francisco. Mr. Postmaster General, thank you for being with us today. Quite frankly, my friends, this announcement today is really something very special because it comes at a time we're so immersed in our national security issues. I just returned from the Munich Security Conference. Uh, subject was Ukraine, 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 and I got back here last night, but that's been since all morning with the uh, Russian assault on, on Ukraine. And I'll take questions on that after we deal with this subject. When we came together last time, we had the privilege of hearing stories from some of our friends in San Francisco. Uh, we heard, uh, well, let me just say first, uh, we heard from Elaine. Uh, Elaine, where are you, Elaine? There she is again with her face mask. Elaine faced a lost loss situation when her, they, when her husband Peter's medicine was delayed, forcing them to put their health on the line and go to the pharmacy in the time of COVID. I'm sorry for the loss of your husband in the meantime, Elaine, but thank you for being with us again today. Michael, a proud veteran, endured double the wait for his VA-ordered epilepsy prescription. And Kathy, who runs a senior home, Kathy Davis, my, her husband was my dear friend for many years, the two of them, uh, and they saw the difficulties inflicted on residents whose deliveries were delayed or lost entirely. This. This is because we were not having the resources put to the Postal Service that it needed. What was, when there was an assault on the Postal Service by others in Washington, we had a tremendous turnout all over the country. We had, don't mess with the post office. Our event here was wonderful. Thank you again, Mr. President, uh, for your participation in that, and we halted the assault on the Postal Service, the lack of resources going there with this legislation that we passed in the House, overwhelmingly bipartisan, and again, to be passed in the Senate next week and then going uh, to, the, uh, to the President. These San Francisco stories that I mentioned serve as an urgent reminder that the U U.S. Postal Service can mean the difference between life and death. It remains true here. You know, but over a billion dollars worth of pharmaceuticals were being delivered to our veterans alone. And that, that there should be a, a, a hesitation or a, a lack of urgency was just unacceptable. We must strengthen the U.S. Postal Service and alleviate the financial burdens threatening uh, reliable delivery. Import. Now, here's what we did. We, we, the, the uh, service reductions that they were proposing would hurt countless families across the Bay Area. Worsening delays would hold up, as I said, about $1.2 billion prescriptions delivered by USPS each year. And absentee ballots, paychecks, Social Security benefits would arrive late and USP would run out of funds it needed to operate. Run out of funds by 2024. 
That is why the House took the historic step passing the bipartisan legislation. It's called the Postal Service Reform Act. It includes bipartisan common sense reforms that deliver more reliable service for families, more predictability for small businesses, more secure future for our devoted postal workers. Many of them are veterans. Here's what it does. It strengthens services by guaranteeing six-day delivery. It bolsters reliability with new transparency measures, securing benefits by welcoming retirees into the Medicare system, which they weren't, and lifting the outrageous, can you imagine, requirement that the U.S. Postal Service pre-fund health benefits for like 75 years in advance. I mean, it's almost impossible to run a business when you have to pay all those many decades into the future. Since San Francisco, at the time of the gold rush, connected our fledging city to the nation, our families have resol uh, relied on the Postal Service. Again, it's mother of five, grandmother of nine. I see firsthand the blessings of delivery from our postal services. Uh, even in this time of technology, we like to see the physical photos and the rest. Uh, the U.S. Postal Service herds our nation together, and uh, we just, uh, this bill is transformative, long overdue, and again, uh, we are very eager for it to be passed. Let me just say, the um, connecting of America by the Postal Service is something that we always, always um, have respected. When it came time for the Postal Service to meet that requirement of all those years in advance, it was crippling to its ability uh, to, to do its job. This bill is so beautiful in my view because it has been written. It has had the advantage of the workers telling us what they think would make the service better, would make the service better. So it's about not what we're telling them, you should be doing this, but listening to what would make the service better. And that's what this legislation does. I'm so very, very proud of it. And now it's my privilege to uh, yield to a very distinguished leader in San Francisco, uh, uh, again, the president of the Board of Supervisors, the Bayview's voice at City Hall, but he speaks for many of us across the city, Mr. President Shaman Walton, Mr. President. Good afternoon, and thank you so much, Madam Speaker. I, I, I really just want to start off by thanking the Speaker for all of her work here in the community, in particular when it comes to the United States Postal Services. A lot of times we reach out to our leaders at the federal level or even at the state level, and we don't get a response that leads to tangible outcomes. But when our office reached out to the Speaker's office to talk about delayed deliveries to talk about some of the problems that were happening in our community. She stepped up, came out and spoke to members of community, and we were able to come up with a resolution to make sure that the mail was on time for our residents here in San Francisco. And once again, our speaker is stepping up to make sure that we don't lose valuable service that we get from our United States Postal Service in our communities. We all know that our seniors, our communities rely on their medicine. We all know that in some cases, people's financial resources come through our mail. And so we had to make sure that we came up with reform that was gonna, of course, save the post office money, but also make sure that the service delivery was going to continue to be efficient. And that's what has happened here. And I'm proud to say and excited to say that anytime you work on policy that includes labor, that is bipartisan, that's how we get the best policy for the people that we all serve, our constituents. So everyone working together has made this reform possible. We will continue to have great service from the post office, but we will also save some money as we work to be efficient. So again, I want to thank the speaker. I want to thank all of our leaders in, later, in labor. And now I want to bring up Ms. Shirley Taylor, who is the national business agent for the American Postal Workers Union. Thank you, Supervisor Walton. On behalf of the President of the American Postal Workers Union, Mark Demonstein, APW Legislative and Political Director Judy Beard, and Cindy DeTango, President of the 1300 
represented members of the San Francisco APW Local 2, as well as the thousands of dedicated postal workers uh, represented by our union, we wish to express our great gratitude to Speaker Nancy Pelosi for her vital role and critical leadership in the passage of the Postal Service Reform Act of 2022 through the House of Representatives with a overwhelming bipartisan uh, majority of 342. The bill will provide the Postal Service with much needed financial relief by eliminating the ill 2006 ill-conceived 2006 prefunding mandate by retire, for retiree health benefits, a requirement that has never been forced on any other private or government entity. In addition to the repeal of the prefunding mandate, the bill will require the USPS to set up a public dashboard on their website, which will publish weekly performance data. This data will allow the public to monitor any service failures, identify mail slow, slow, slow down, and, and prioritize zip codes experiencing consistent diminished service performance. These tools will allow us to determine specific areas across the country in need of additional postal investments. This bill will also include language that will protect the six-day delivery. A short time ago, we gathered at the Bayview Station Post Office, located a short distance from here. At that time, we were fighting the Postal Service, the dismantling of mail processing machines, removal of collection box, and the curtailing, curtailing of hours of service. Despite these nefarious attempts to undermine the People's Postal Service, postal employees, as always, rose to the occasion, processing and delivering checks, ballots, medicines, and thousands and thousands of parcels to the American public. With the help of public pressure and our champions in Congress, we were able to stop some of these draconian measures which were being implemented by the service. Unfortunately, we have been unable to prevent the closure of the San Francisco International Service Center, which is now in progress. At this time, we are unable to ascertain how this will impact mailing system when it closes. Now we must continue fighting together, united in solidarity, until the Postal Service Reform Act is the law of the land. Thank you for your attendance and your support today. I would now like to present Christina August, Assistant Secretary Treasurer, Golden Gate Branch 214, National Association of Letter Carriers. Hello. My name is Christina August. As Shirley said, I'm an officer for NALC Branch 214. I'm joined here actually by fellow officers Marvin Bolin and Juan Caldera. So I was a letter carrier at 180 Napoleon. It's actually just a couple blocks from where we're standing now. Uh, but I've delivered all over San Francisco from 3601 Lyons Street, which is also known as the Palace of Fine Arts. I've delivered packages on Steiner to one of the painted ladies, uh, but my primary zone was down along Ocean Avenue. So the route I carried every day I had a pickup from a residential address, the same residential address. This customer would give me anywhere from 5 to 30 prepaid packages. They were orders for his small business. Because I went by his house every day, the Postal Service provided my service to him at no charge. So we enabled him to run his small business without ever leaving his front steps through the convenience and reliability of USPS. Our letter carriers strongly believe in providing continued mail service to everyone at affordable rates. The recent passage of this bill, spearheaded by Speaker Pelosi, will help preserve the quality service that our neighbors count on now and for years to come. Our Postal Service is the most trusted and highest rated agency in the federal government. Our letter carriers, as well as other employees, play an essential role in our economy. When this bill is passed in the Senate, the pre-funding mandate will be removed. The USPS will be well positioned to thrive in the 21st century by investing in its networks, providing new products, and improving service quality. This legislation makes it possible for someone like me to have a future at the Postal Service. We wish to thank Speaker Pelosi for bringing this legislation forward and helping it pass. Now we need to continue fighting 
organizing, and mobilizing together until the Postal Service Reform Act is passed by the Senate and signed into law. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce Assistant to the National President, John Beaumont. Thank you, Christina. Good afternoon. Several of us gathered down the street just two years ago at the Bayview Post Office to highlight protecting the future of the Postal Service. A lot has happened across this country since that time. Our country has come to rely upon the Postal Service and its role in the nation's infrastructure now more than ever. Our service continues to be the essential hub of a mailing industry that employs another some 7.3 million American workers. Our unmatchable networks link more than 161 million American households with businesses to each other seven days a week. Our service is essential to multiple industries, communities, populations, e-commerce, prescription drugs, the nation's paper, publishing, and advertising business, and millions of small businesses and tens of millions of citizens across this country. Thanks to our role as letter carriers and postal employees, and especially during the last presidential election when half of America voted by mail, Many in Washington have now come to realize the value of our nation's point postal infrastructure. This, in large part, has helped the House to come together to pass the Postal Reform Act. This bill addresses the losses imposed uniquely burdensome requirement that we have to prefund our retirement health benefits 75 years into the future. This is a requirement that no other federal agency or private industry has on them. This encompasses over 95% of any losses in years that we had losses, and usually we're in the black without this. The Postal Service Reform Act will eliminate the unfair pre-funding mandate, and it will also make permanent six-day mail delivery the value customers have come to rely upon. When passed by the Senate and signed into law, this legislation will also strengthen our core services for our constituents. Improving door-to-door -door service, upgrading new postal facilities, replacing our over 30-year-old outdated vehicles, and providing convenient post office hours. This all revolves around this bill. We would like to sincerely thank Speaker Pelosi for all the hard work she has done and continues to do to protect the future of the Postal Service for the citizens of this nation. We also wish to thank and express the appreciation for the overwhelming bipartisan support of over 342 members of the House of Representatives who work with the Speaker to diligently pass this crucial legislation. As the Postal Reform Act moves forward to the U.S. Senate in the upcoming weeks, we will keep up the fight together until this critical legislation is signed into law. It is now my honor to bring back our Speaker of the House of Representatives, Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Uh, I've known John and his job for many, many years, and he has served in almost every capacity in, of the letter carriers. Uh, I am particularly happy today because this is about meeting the needs of people where they live. And, again, not everybody is on the Internet, but even if they are, uh, they have their packages that they want to receive or they mail they want uh, to receive uh, firsthand and soon. And so when we talked about, uh, actually when, uh, when um, Christina talked about the mobilization of this, this is what it was. It was, again, the intellectual resource that the workers provided to us. It was the outside mobilization those um, don't mess with the postal service events that we had where the American people just waited and said, this is the most popular agency of government. And quite frankly, the postal, per the person who comes to your door is probably one of the most popular people <laughs> that you <laughs> welcome to at your door. I know what I do in my home, and I mentioned Maddie, my friend. He works at the Postal Service. He met his wife at the Postal Service. <laughs> we were happy to honor them in our home when they uh, got married. So it, it's, a, it's a family thing as well. So uh, with that, again, just think if you were having a business, and when you started your business, you were told, okay, this is, your, this is what you need for your materials. This is what you need to pay your um, workers. This is what you need in terms of renting the space and this or that. 
And by the way, you have to pay the health benefits for your workers for 75 years into the future. How could that possibly make sense? Well, this changing that is really a liberation. I'll make one more point and then take questions. And that is, at the same time as all this is going on, when we're doing the infrastructure bill and build back better and the rest, there are all kinds of initiatives that talk about changing the, uh, the vehicles of the Postal Service into electric, into green, green um, uh, uh, vehicles. And that's progress for us in many ways as well. With that, I'm pleased to take any t questions, and I hope that we could stick with this first on the purpose of our coming here. Any questions on the Postal Service? Well, just be on the lookout. The first week in March, we go back um, uh, this, the beginning of next week, and then the, we have the State of the Union address by the President, which we're very excited about, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to do it in a more relaxed COVID way, but we don't know. We'll just hear... Uh, from the uh, capital physician about that, and then this bill will be passed shortly in that week. Any other questions that you may have? Yes. Yes. Yeah. No, I think that what the president, uh, we're very blessed to have this president with his knowledge of foreign affairs, his uh, understanding of the personalities that he has to deal with, and his uh, diplomatic accomplishment to bring all of the, they all did this working together, it wasn't just the U.S., but all of the 30 nations of NATO coming together as one uh, around this sanctions package. Yes, it, it wasn't to... Um, they were going to be enacted if they went in. And what the president said today is to ratchet it up. And that's what he is doing. And uh, I feel I, the package is very, very, very devastating uh, to Russia. I had the privilege of talking to the speaker of the, uh, uh, of the Ukraine parliament this morning, that's one of the reasons I was later uh, today, uh, to, just to hear from him, he called me to say what they wanted. And what they wanted was more intense sanctions. That's what they were asking for, more intense and swift sanctions shortly thereafter the president made that announcement. So, you know, no, I think we're, diplomacy, diplomacy, diplomacy. There is you know, war is not an answer to anything. What Putin is doing is an attack on democracy as well as on Ukraine. And what we're doing with Ukraine is making sure that we have humanitarian assistance to help the people, that we have lethal defense weapons going into uh, Ukraine to the tune of $600 million for them to fight their own fight. And um, again, uh, Many statements by all of the pres uh, heads of state, some presidents, some prime ministers, whatever it is, about how wrong this is, so that the people feel that the world is connected to them as they protect the Ukraine and defend democracy. Well, I don't know. It, it, we'll see how that works. It's not going to happen in the next couple of days. This is a um, a. a and, and what's interesting about it, because I just came back from the Munich conference, as I mentioned, the Munich Security Conference, where I could see representatives of all these countries meet with many of them. We met with the new chancellor of Germany, and then we, then we went to England and met with UK and met with uh, Boris Johnson, but all the other people that we met there, presidents of com countries, defense ministers, foreign ministers, and the rest, all united in saying, this is a big uh, this is a big um, undertaking that we're going to try without engaging in a third world war, how we can make sure that the devastation that has to happen to the Russian economy happens by the use of sanctions through democracy. And again, try to get a message to the Russian people that we're, this isn't about them, it's about Vladimir Putin. Yeah. Yes. Well, the, the president has the authority to do that. 
uh, if we, but President, and, and use of sanctions, that's all within the authority of the president. Uh, it would be nice if we could have legislation just supporting that, uh, but I don't know. In other words, we'll, we'll see if, if that's necessary. It's not necessary, but we'll see if that would be good, because the unity of NATO is very important in all of this. The unity of America would be very important to demonstrate as well. But the president did not need an act of Congress to do the sanctions. We're, he has, as he has said repeatedly, we're not going to have boots on the ground in Ukraine. But any use of force would have to be approved by the Congress. The message to the people of Ukraine is obviously one that is... Uh, uh, it's a sad, heartbreaking time. We pray for them. We support them with our humanitarian assistance. We also support them with our military assistance as well. The um, speaker said to me there was a great appreciation for what America is doing and a recognition of it. But it is, um, it, there, we'll just see what the insurgency can do and, uh, and just see how ruthless Vladimir Putin will continue to be. But it is a, it's one where, as I said, they have asked for us to be speaking out more about, not more, continue to speak out about their plight and the, uh, the fact that it is unprovoked and um, reckless on the part of Vladimir Putin. Uh, in a previous, uh, today, we'll have a, a briefing for the whole Congress, and it's just a short while. And then next week, we'll, when we return, we'll have an in-person classified briefing. But all, all, every step of the way is to point out this is a terrible loss of life, unnecessary, collateral damage to civilians, the children, the speaker brought up the children, and the, um, again, even to the military on both sides. The Russian mothers do not want their children coming home because for something that was in a body bag, because of something that was unnecessary on the part of uh, Vladimir Putin. Speaker Pelosi, we're about to go to a demonstration at City Hall with a bunch of Ukrainians, and some of them are saying that the United States should be doing more. Is there a red line for you to where you would think that the United States should be considering? Well, we are doing more. Uh, are, are, well, the, in other words, the the NATO if Title Five of uh, uh, Article Five of NATO says uh, harm to one is a harm to all. Ukraine is not a NATO country. The NATO countries that surround it are very concerned about what Putin is doing, uh, but it is my belief.